Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the uh, clear, sunny, beautiful Mile High City for today. My name is Ken Reed, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Executive Vice President of the American Water Resources Association. And we are glad to be back in Denver yet again for uh, our annual conference. And in fact, this is the 50th annual conference of the American Water Resources Association. We were founded in 1964 and had our 50th anniversary last year. And in 1965 was the first conference. I know most of you probably weren't born there at that time, but uh, uh, the, uh, we, had the, we actually had the founder. And uh, Denver has always been a favorite place to, to come. And we have a packed program. We are near, we probably will be near record attendance. And uh, we're here to have fun, learn something, and get to know one another. And with that, it is my uh, pleasure to introduce to you the president of the American Water Resources Association for 2015, Dr. John Tracy from the Water Resources Research Institute at the University of Idaho in Boise, Idaho. John. Uh, thank you, Ken. Um, this has turned out to be, uh, um, in recent memory, one of the biggest, best conferences and uh, that AWA has put on in, in, in a while. And so we're glad to be back in Denver. I grew up in Boulder, so this is kind of home to me, although I haven't lived here for a number of years. So it's nice to be back on the front range. Uh, first, I would like to introduce the members of the AWA board. And just because we're a, a diverse group, and I, I love that fact about us, we're spread out all over the audience. And so I'm going to sit here and go, OK, I see Lisa Butler. Yay, Lisa. I see Wayne Wright. He's on the board. Now I'm sitting here thinking, OK, where's Brenda? Oh, there's David. There's Secretary Treasurer. Where's Br oh, Brenda's back there. Won't even stand up. OK, Roth, Frias. Where's Roth? OK, Roth is over there. M Martha, who's the uh, president-elect. She'll be the president starting January 1st. Uh, past president Mark Dunning is not here. And I don't have, let's see, where is? Noel, Noel, no, there's Noel, okay. And I think I've covered the board, right? Yeah. Now, um, two of the members of the board are coming off the board this year. This is Noel and Roth, but uh, we're, we're keeping them on because Roth is the incoming president-elect and he'll start on January 1st. David Watt is stepping down after a long time being secretary treasurer for the organization. Thank him for his service. And Noel is coming on as the secretary treasurer starting on January 1st and assuming the duties. Um, so uh, that uh, we'd like to thank. Well, we'd like to thank um, these conferences. Don't come together without the AWA staff. And again, not going to introduce them all in the room, but they're spread out all over the room. And I'm uh, really glad to work with such a fine staff. And, and uh, the uh, th they're a big part of why these conferences come off so well. But the bigger part has to do with the organizing committee and the people that take on the uh, thankless duty of organizing the conference and making all the calls and you know, pushing to get all the papers in and, uh, you know, working to get everything set up so that the conference comes off well. And this year's chairman is Laurel, Laurel Stadjahar, and I'd like to thank Laurel for um, bringing together a phenomenal conference, and I'd like to have Laurel introduce the planning committee. Oh, first, here's your plaque. Thank you. And here's your water bottle. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, John. And before I introduce the rest of the planning committee, you can probably sit for a minute, John. Okay. Um, I just wanted to, to say a few things. Thank you very much for coming to this conference. Welcome to Denver. The conference planning committee, the section of the Colorado section of AWRA, um, we're just very glad you're here. As Ken said, we're close to record attendance. We'll hopefully get there over the week with some walk-in registrations. Um, Wayne Aspinall, who's a congressman from Colorado and a player in shaping water in the West, is often quoted as saying, in the West, when you touch water, you touch everything. And as you'll see throughout the conference, that's a theme that has continued. Um, with our keynote speakers, Jim and Ken, you'll see them talk about both paleohydrology in the West as well as um, the current state of Colorado River Basin. 
Um, those, of us, those of us that went on the tour of Confluence Park in the beautiful sunny day yesterday, we took advantage of the sun until the snow comes in tomorrow or this evening. Um, we got to learn about some of the great work that the Greenway Foundation has done down at Confluence Park and throughout the state, as well as some of the work that Denver Water is doing in the area. Um, the theme of Water in the West also continues tomorrow night in a really fun and exciting event. If you have not yet registered yet, I highly encourage you do so. Um, Brad Udall is going to tell us about how his family is intricately tied to some of the ways that water was developed in the West. He gives a very interesting talk, and there'll be a fun little competition after that with some great prizes. So we highly recommend that you join us. For the rest of the week, we have an outstanding technical program that would not have been possible without our great technical chairs, Tom Check and Reagan Wascom. And in a minute here, I'll give them their certificates. Um, they did a great job. And one of the other things that we had that, that was the un inaugural event at this conference was the AWA National Leadership Institute workshop for state officials. There were 19 leaders from across the country that came and talked about state water planning. That theme will continue throughout the conference, uh, and there will be a special session on Thursday regarding Colorado's very first water plan, which is due to be finalized and to the governor in the next few weeks. Along, along with the outstanding technical programs that we have for you this week, we also have great opportunities for you to network with each other and talk to your colleagues. Uh, tonight, there's the opening network reception. Uh, highly recommend that you go to that. Also, during the breaks and where that networking reception is, is across the, the port Corsair, which I can't say correctly, um, and it's up on the 38th floor. It's a beautiful room, so come on up tonight and, and get to know everybody. Um, and one thing that I'm going to task you all with doing during this conference is to get to know three people that you haven't met before in water resources. AWRA's mantra is community, conversation, and connections. And I'd like to continue that, grow that, so let's all get to know each other a little better and continue the conversation about water. Thank you so much for joining us for this engaging week, learning more about water with those of us that are passionate about it. It could not have been possible without the fabulous staff of AWRA. Thank you to the staff and to the board of AWRA and also with my committee. I'll go ahead and introduce them now. Reagan Wascom. Yes, you do. <laughs> Sorry, I'm writing my other piece of paper. Reagan, I can't, there's no place to put this. I just need to. Reagan Wascom is the technical program co-chair. He's with the Colorado Water Resources Research Institute with Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. Thank you, Reagan, for all your hard work. And Tom Check who is the conference technical pro -chair, program co-chair with Reagan with One World, One Water, Metropolitan State University in Denver. He already got his water bottle. <laughs> and now John is going to give the certificates to the rest of the committee. So my committee chairs, the finance committee chair, Chris Sanchez with Bishop Brogdon Associates in Englewood, Colorado. Jack Denman, who is also a finance committee co-chair with ERO, Water Resor or ERO Resources Corporation in Denver, Colorado. Sorry, Jack. <laughs> and next, our special events field trip, trip co-chairs, Mike McHugh with the city of Aurora in Aurora. Mike was here last night. He may not be here yet this morning. All right. And Jeff Bandy, who couldn't make it today, he's with Denver Water. He was our other field trip co-chair. Um, our student event co-chairs, 
Bill Bataglin with the USGS in Denver, Colorado. And Katie Melander with Norder Northern Water, Water uh, Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District. <laughs> and our exhibits chairs, Mark McCluskey with CDM Smith in Denver, Colorado. and the program committee that was headed up by Tom and Reagan and Mark Ellsworth with the University of Northern Colorado in Greeley. We're not entirely sure some of these guys are here. Oh, you need to come up and get your certificate, please. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> And Chuck Hennig with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation in Denver, Colorado. <laughs> Chad Kinney with Colorado State University in Pueblo. Don't think he made it this morning. And John Studnick with Colorado State University who also is not here yet. So thank you so much to all of my committee members. This outstanding conference would not have been possible without you. So thank you for all your hard work. Tom Check is going to introduce our first plenary speaker. It's my, it's my great pleasure to introduce Ken Wright. Uh, Ken founded the consulting engineering firm Wright Water Engineers of Denver, Colorado. Uh, Wright Water Engineers specializes in public works and water resources with three Colorado offices and a staff of 45. The firm will celebrate its 54th year in 2015. Since 1994, Mr. Wright has done extensive research on ancient waterworks at Machu Picchu, Tipan, Moray, Oyan Tetambo in Peru and the southwestern U.S. This work has earned Mr. Wright six academic awards from Peru's leading universities, a decoration from Peru's president, and an honorary doctor in science degree from the University of Wisconsin. Very cool. Mr. Wright. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to do today is visit a remote uh, basin in the Colorado River Basin, a remote area, I should say, Mesa Verde, and I want to tell you about how these ancient people developed a water, a community water supplies that were very successful. The first one I want to be showing you is a, a basin, a, a reservoir that was started in 750 A.D., and continued on in operation for 300 years uh, until uh, about 1150 or 1100 AD. And what we, well, by studying ancient, the water supplies of ancient people, we call that paleohydrology, we learn a lot about what we can do today. And uh, one of the things, first things we learned was the amount of effort, time and trouble, these early people, early Americans, put into their water supply to make it uh, feasible. And it made me realize how cheap our water rates are in present day in, in comparison with the kind of effort and time and money these ancient people put into their water supplies. But here you see uh, a site, uh, uh, a, cliff a cliff house. Now when we think of Mesa Verde, and how many of you have been to Mesa Verde? Raise your hand. 
Oh, that is about 85%. That's a lot. At any rate, when you uh, think of, when most people think of Mesa Verde, they think of cliff houses. And they're beautiful, but our main thrust, our main area of study was in earlier people, Pueblo I people that started in about 700 AD, and then Pueblo II people that started in about um, 900 AD to 1100 AD, and these are the kind of houses they had. When we think of their troubles and tribulations, they went through lots of ups and downs in their water supply. The red, of course, is below average. The blue is above average. And what we, when we study these periods, we realize that there were several uh, great droughts that these people lasted through. One of them was started in 1135 and went for some 50 years. It was a granddaddy drought that was felt all over the uh, central United States, as well as the southwest United States. But let's take a look at uh, 1155, uh, I mean, that the first drought I was telling you about, it would be right in this location, a lot of red. Later, most people said that, uh, or think that the, uh, the ancient people left southwestern Colorado and the Four Corners area because of a drought in, uh, that started in 1275, and that is shown right in here. And uh, just in passing, because so many of us are interested in the Colorado River Compact, let's just take a look at uh, the time when the uh, compact was being developed. A lot of red, which uh, I'm sure our next speaker will be describing in some more detail. But what we're looking at is southwestern Colorado, and uh, the average that you see there happens to be 18 inches, or maybe 18.1 inches of rainfall, precipitation, thanks to Jeffrey Dean of Arizona and doing all of this work for us. Um, the first one I'm gonna, reservoir set I'm gonna take you to is Moorefield Reservoir, and that is located at the lower southwest corner. There's a mound there. And one of the difficulties the scientists had to start with, and hydrologists, was how, if it was a reservoir, how come it's a mound? Well, it's a mound because of something called sedimentation. Over 350 years, you can imagine how much sediment, even at a small rate, uh, flowed into the reservoir. And it, the Indians would dredge the reservoir periodically and throw the dredging material off to the side and over 350 years, the reservoir turned into a mound. We were fortunate enough to be given the opportunity by the National Park Service to excavate this mound, and we happened to dig the largest trench uh, I think ever dug in Mesa Verde. We hired the largest backhoe in the county, but anyway, we built, uh, dug this trench some 20 feet deep, um, and uh, discovered many things. We had a big crew of uh, maybe a dozen archeologists, half a dozen uh, water resources people, and for a, a, a period of time, about a week, we studied the trench walls with intensity. One of the things we found was all of the, uh, uh, all of the things that you can find out by digging into the ground, because there's a record there of what happened. This happens to be a sand layer dating to about maybe 800 AD. And the wind on that particular day was blowing from the southwest. It's a kind of detail that you can learn from studying ancient people. Here you see layering. The uh, sandy area represents uh, flooding events. Uh, we found that there were uh, some uh, 24 periods of heavy runoff where sand was carried in and laid down inside the reservoir. The clay layers in between were a very tight, very fine, uh, less than 200 screen. And then we, uh, there were discussions as to whether or not it was a true reservoir because some scientists thought it was a platform for um, 
dan a dance platform for ancient people to celebrate on. But anyway, what we found by taking soil samples like this, we came across this redoxomorphic uh, deposit, which demonstrated that water had been standing uh, in this uh, air in this reservoir for a long time to cause this uh, action with the iron. Looking down on, as a plan, the uh, blue li the blue line is the creek of uh, of uh, the of the canyon and, and showing how it bypasses the original uh, creek came right through the middle and what the indians had done in about 750 AD was to dig a little hole in the channel and it didn't take long for that to silt up and that's how this whole process started but it started as a hole in the ground ended up as a mound 20 feet high now these people were smart, they were industrious, and they were well organized. Because in about 860 AD, they also had enough energy and enough organization to build the largest kiva in the Mesa Verde National Park, 57 feet in diameter. And this is for religious purposes and also for providing a, a shelter for, during the winter time. The next reservoir I want to take you to is called Farview Reservoir. It's the most controversial in the whole park, and it always has been, even from the days of the early explorations of the 1800s. Um, it turns out to be a, uh, 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 well, it was thought to be a, possibly a dance platform. It was thought by others to be a, a kiva. Um, Dr. Bredernitz of Delor uh, Dolores River Basin area uh, was convinced it was a reservoir and his excavations proved that. At any rate, back in about 1916, the Park Service superintendent uh, went back into the uh, backwoods and uh, this is a picture taken in the uh, reservoir at that time. There wasn't much there except the hole in the ground because of the ravages of five, well, 700 years or so of uh, weather and uh, deposition and uh, runoff and wind deposit sediment. When we started, the, um, the Park Service had these signs up. One theory that it was a reservoir and the other theory was that it was a dance pavilion. And believe it or not, the controversy, even after all of our study, uh, still exists as to whether or not it was a reservoir or a, uh, uh, a dance pavilion. And uh, it's kind of one of those things in uh, uh, the archaeological field that there are many disputes over what the facts uh, tell us. Inside the reservoir, uh, Farview Reservoir, where we did detailed surveys. We did uh, drill, uh, drill holes to collect soil samples, very important, and to collect pollen samples because the pollen samples tell us a lot. Because corn and uh, beans, all kinds of vegetation, leave their traces in my, minute sized pollen, which can be identified by pollenologists. The big question we had was, how could this site collect water when it was on a ridge, a mesa top? It had been studied uh, years ago by hydrologists from CSU, and they concluded that it could not be a reservoir because there was no way to develop, a, no, to develop runoff. But what happened was that during our studies, we happened to have a uh, about a third of an inch of rainfall, intense rainfall in the evening. It went back in the morning and there was water standing in the, uh, in the uh, edge of the reservoir. And then when we looked closer, um, we saw that the night before, the uh, runoff from the places where the tourists had been walking, packed on the ground like a parking lot, I uh, had f uh, washed into the uh, into the reservoir, as shown by this uh, uh, sand created sand channel 
created the night before. At any rate, when we finished our work, they changed the description of the site to Farview Reservoir and very pleased with that. The next site we studied was a, um, another reservoir site that was uh, we call uh, Sagebrush Reservoir. And what you see there is a cross in the middle. And that is the remains of uh, the, the trench excavations done by Dr. Jack Smith who had been, uh, for 13 years, chief archaeologist for the park. And he was also a member of our team. One of the things we learned early on was that if we're, as engineers, if we we're going to study archaeological sites, we had to make sure that our facts were in line with known science. And for that reason, we would get on our team many types of experts, including uh, experienced archaeologists, to make sure that scientifically we were not at odds with the uh, profession. The excavations, trench excavations, showed layering. Uh, you can t see here the yellow being sand deposits and the dark color being clay. And this particular reservoir uh, lasted from about 950 AD to 1100 AD until it was finally abandoned for various reasons related to drought periods. But uh, they were able to last through the big granddaddy drought, the one I told you about of 1130 to, that lasted for 50 years. This one, uh, this reservoir, if you look carefully, we'll see that uh, the, the original pond that had been dug by the Indians is shown here. It was about 30 feet in diameter. And then over time, silt settled in and filled up the hole. And then they extended the reservoir to a maybe 100 feet long. Uh, this location on the left, on the lower uh, cross section, actually fits to the upper right. So you can see that it was a long reservoir uh, with continuing sedimentation. The upper zone uh, is post-reservoir. It was Aeolian sand deposits. And at that time, the Indians were using it likely for uh, ceremonial purposes. But they were still there because artifacts were continued to be found in the upper zone. We did lots of testing, including infiltration tests. And what we found was that where the uh, native nat natural uh, soil was undisturbed, not packed it down, the infiltration rate was enormous, like maybe 15 inches per hour. And that's what this uh, infiltrometer told us. However, where the Indians would do their uh, farming and walk with bare feet or kids running around the, the, uh, 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 the buildings, packing down the uh, soil, it became impervious, highly impervious. As we showed here, we had to demonstrate to the archaeologists how a little bit of compaction would create a runoff coefficient similar to that of an asphalt parking lot. And here you see, uh, in effect, this is like a model. We have the uh, collection basin where we've packed, uh, compacted the s soil with our thumb and the heel of our hand, and then poured water in, let the archaeologists pour the water in and see it run into what considered we, uh, judged, we uh, illustrated would be a reservoir. This proved that when the soil was compacted just by foot traffic, or by tourist traffic, the runoff would go up and there would be runoff. The final site I want to show you at Mesa Verde, reservoir site, is a site that we call Box Elder Reservoir. You see a mound here. Same thing again. The silt carried in by the canal over a period of several hundred years created a mound. And it would last until it became so high that it was impractical to root water into the reservoir anymore. But here you see Fox Elder Reservoir, and it's a huge deposit of silt. We tested it by drilling uh, using hand augers, and we rapidly found out that the compacted clay was tight. Our six foot four uh, strong armed uh, athlete on the right uh, could go down about 10 feet, and that was it. So the Bureau of Reclamation came to our aid, and 
loaned us a drilling rig. And here we see Dr. Bredernitz on the right and Richard uh, from the Bureau of Reclamation on the left. And here we're able to go down 20 feet with ease and quick. The samples we got were tested at the Bureau of Reclamation Laboratory and we got lots of good test results from that. And here you see some more redoxomorphic signs, the uh, uh, iron coloring on one of our core samples. Here you see uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, uh, Greg Hobbs, who's on our team, a good water rights uh, attorney, pointing to a ancient canal from Pueblo One times where we found some Pueblo One artifacts that showed us, told us a lot about this particular site. From the standpoint of artifacts, they're all over the park in the backwoods, and uh, that's one reason why they limit uh, uh, tourists to uh, specific areas so that people do not pick up things like arrowheads and uh, uh, fire stones. You can see how this has been used for uh, using a twig and a, uh, a rope, a string, and uh, turning it until the heat generated enough heat to get the fire started. But this is artifacts are at the site. A, uh, some type of uh, war club. And then finally, we said, well, we looked at these reservoirs. What about cisterns? Well, we found one site that had a 4,000-gallon cistern. It's at Mug House. Mug House has been closed to the public for about 100 years, but it is now open if you get a tour to the site uh, guided by a ranger. At any rate, this is Mug House site. Mug House, it was a site that was occupied with about 80 people from maybe uh, 1220 to about 1280 when the people left overnight, left their, it's like they left their dinner on the table. And anyway, right here, uh, uh, Justice Hobbs and myself are in the 4,000 gallon reservoir. And how was it filled? It was filled by a, a, a flow off the cap rock up above. This gives a cross section of how the uh, uh, water system worked. Here you see the cistern at the bottom. The water would, uh, the rainfall would run off from the mesa top, flow down, and then down the, the cliff into the cistern. And this, like I say, was abandoned about maybe 1280 AD when the people left in a big hurry. It's called Mug House because there were mugs hanging on, the, uh, on one of the poles uh, that were found by the original uh, investigators, uh, cowboys back in about 1875. To help study this site and make sure we knew how the mechanic, the, the hydraulics worked, we got permission from the Park Service to uh, rappel off the cliff, and we uh, were able to simulate flows of five gallons per minute and 10 gallons a minute and 20 gallons per minute by pouring five gallon uh, jugs of water on the cap rock and letting it run off. And down below it came over such as this shown here. And uh, we were able to get a good view of the uh, jet and we were able to describe that uh, uh, mathematically. And yes, it went right into the uh, cistern down below. And we, we then, by studying the rainfall and intensity that we estimated for this period back in uh, the, uh, the uh, 13th century, uh, and we were able to compute how often the reservoir, the cistern would fill, and it wasn't very often. We, they would get a fill the 4,000 gallons maybe once every two years. But even a small amount of water was very, very important because if they didn't have the cistern, they'd have to walk about a mile and a half to a spring and carry the water back. I'm going to take you, uh, Sally, do we still have a little time? Okay. We're going to go now to the beautiful, wonderful site, in fact, four site, six sites of Hovenweep. And if you haven't been to Hovenweep, you have to go there. There's one site called Goodman Point near Cortez, and there's five uh, sites in uh, 
Western Colorado and Eastern Utah that are most to see, and I want to show you why you should see those. Dr. Brevitz on the left, who's now passed away, but he was a dean of archaeology in the state of Colorado. We tested the spring yield, and this Goodman Point, which is nine miles northwest of, uh, of Cortez, uh, lasted because they relied upon a spring that yielded about maybe two gallons a minute. And that's a lot of water, believe it or not, for a, for a site of this type, which housed maybe, um, well, believe it or not, six to 800 people. But they, used, they developed the water carefully and uh, husbanded it thoroughly. And then nearby is, Mummy is uh, Goodman Point Reservoir. And you can see here, and how was that filled? Well, take a look behind. The Indians were f smart enough to know that water would run off from this cap rock that you see in the background, and we're also able to figure out the uh, retention uh, amount of water on a rainfall, and how the water would then enter, flow into the reservoir, and how much it would hold. In eastern Utah, we uh, are studying hub and weep uh, uh, buildings. And it was a place of uh, reliance on groundwater, for the most part. Springs that, even today, you wouldn't believe it, but the yield of these springs is not measured in gallons per minute, or liters per minute, but in terms of drops per minute. And we, uh, the way we measure it is count the drops uh, and find out whether it's 17, 18, or 50 drops in one minute, and we can convert that into a specific yield in terms of gallons or cubic centimeters or cubic meters. Square Tower is a marvelous uh, building that's built right near their spring. It isn't, like I say, it's a spring that's minimal, measured in drops per minute, but it's the only water in the area. They relied upon this. Uh, this the site was abandoned about uh, t maybe uh, 1280 A.D. And the uh, people moved south and left these fantastic uh, buildings that were discovered by uh, Mormon uh, missionaries back in about, uh, I think, about 1870 uh, or so. Our uh, research on these ancient water supplies is appreciated by the uh, uh, Pueblo people, modern Pueblo people. Here you see two elders from the uh, Hopi tribe that blessed the reservoirs, said the appropriate prayers, and sprinkled the corn uh, kernels. And uh, the uh, sites were celebrated by American Society of Civil Engineers. And there you can see the uh, director in second from the right, Dr. Brennan is second from the, well, second from the right, and uh, Pat, uh, can't think of his last name right offhand, but the executive director of ASCE on the second from the left. And um, they were dedicated as prehistoric Mesa Verde Reservoirs, National Historic Silver Engine Landmarks, and it reads uh, Mesa Verde's industrious ancestral uh, Pueblans designed, constructed, and maintained uh, Moorfield, Box Elder, Fireview, and uh, Sagebrush Reservoirs for domestic water storage uh, between A.D. 750 and 1180. What happened in 1180 was that people began moving from the mesa tops and valley bottoms to the uh, cliff dwellings where they had more defensive opportunities because in about 1180 and lasting for roughly 100 years there was turmoil in this area with a lot of raids and massacres and people abandoned their pueblos on the mesa tops and moved to cliff dwellings which could be defended much better but by 1280 and 1300 things got so bad that people left like I showed you, Mug House uh, was abandoned in about 1180, and I told you that the material, when Art Rohn exam uh, researched and excavated that site back in uh, 
about 1974. He described it as, as if the people had left so quick they left with their dinner still on the table and mugs hanging from the ceiling. So that gives you a little background on a area of the Colorado River Basin of more than a thousand years ago, and water was tight then, but people lived and uh, uh, prospered uh, with a meager amount of water because they knew how to manage water and develop what little water there was. I would say that we could judge these ancient Indians to be the best water resources engineers that America ever turned out for being able to do so much with so little. And that concludes the first lecture of our morning series. Thank you, Ken, that was very interesting. Next, James Lockhead with Denver Water, he's the CEO and general manager, will present insight into the continuing crisis on the Colorado River. Jim was appointed Denver Water's chief executive officer and manager in 2010. Denver Water is Colorado's largest and oldest water utility, serving 1.3 million people in and around the city of Denver. He currently serves on various boards, and prior to joining Gener Denver Water, Mr. Lockhead was a shareholder at the Denver law firm of Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber, and Shrek, where he worked on a wide variety of water resource issues, both nationally and internationally. He served as the executive director of the Colorado Department of Natural Resources from 1994 to 1998. Jim previously served as the governor's representative on the interstate Colorado River operations, and he was appointed by the governor to the Colorado Water Conservation Board, the Upper Colorado River Commission, Great Outdoors Colorado, and Colorado's Roadless Area Task Force. Jim is now going to give a very interesting talk about the current state of the Colorado River. Thank you very much. I am uh, struck by the span of time that uh, the, our two little talks will, uh, will encompass, and um, particularly the speed at which um, we have developed a great dependency of millions and millions of people on uh, a resource and the amount of uncertainty that we're going to face in the future in terms of managing that resource into the future. I can only, I can't imagine what the Colorado River Basin might look like 100 years from now, much less three, four, or 500 years from now. Um, and we can only hope we manage it in a way that's wise. Um, speaking of that dependency, just to, uh, what, what I'd like to do is kind of give a little bit of an overview of the basin itself the water allocation structure that's in place and talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we're currently facing with the drought that we have in the Colorado River Basin and some of the challenges and uncertainties we may f face in the future um, going forward. Seven states are dependent on the Colorado River and of course the country of Mexico. Close to 40 million people and, a million, and five and a half million acres of irrigation. Um, and, and really, in terms of the, that 40 million people, most of those people are living outside the basin. So the Denver Front Range, Salt Lake City, Albuquerque, um, the Los Angeles, Southern California Coastal Plain, um, Phoenix, although it is in the basin as a matter of uh, being a tributary of the Colorado River, it exports a lot of water from the Colorado River through the Central Arizona Project. Um, despite the... Um, heat, I guess, that Las Vegas gets, um, it's actually a riparian city. It sits right on the, uh, on the Colorado River um, and pulls water from, from Lake Mead. In terms of total use, about 20 percent of uh, use in the, in the basin is uh, municipal, 80 percent is agriculture. Of that 80 percent, the vast majority of it is, well, both municipal and agriculture is in grass, whether it's bluegrass, pasture grass, or alfalfa grass. There's a lot of grass that's being grown uh, from, from water in the Colorado River Basin. 
And I'll talk today about the two major uh, reservoirs um, uh, in the basin, Lake Mead and um, Lake Powell. I'm going to go back to this map. The, just real quickly in terms of the law of the river and the Colorado River Compact, and I'll talk about when that was developed and kind of the hydrology. But the compact divides the basin into two halves, an upper half of uh, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, and New Mexico, and a lower half of California, Arizona, and Nevada. And the dividing line is a natural hydrologic pinch point in the river at Lee's Ferry, Arizona. Uh, and Lake Powell is right at the, at the, the upper end of um, Lee's Ferry and is the bank account by which the upper basin states um, are able to meet their obligation to the lower basin states to not deplete the flow of the river below 75 million acre feet over any 10 year running average. Lake Mead in the lower basin is a, both reservoirs are federally owned. Lake Mead is, is managed and run by the Secretary of the Interior and all water uses that occur from Lake Mead occur through a contract with the Secretary. So whether it is the municipal water supply for Las Vegas or the agricultural water supply for the Imperial Valley or the Central Arizona Project or the municipal water district of Southern California which supplies the Southern California coastal plain. It's all pursuant to a contract with the Secretary of the Interior who is referred to as the water master in the lower basin. So what you have are two very different systems of water allocation between the upper basin and the lower basin. The upper basin is managed each state individually under an individual state water law, managed um, different systems. Um, the federal government has a very limited role, mostly through reclamation projects and the management of large federal reservoirs. In the lower basin, it's largely managed uh, almost exclusively by the federal government and the Secretary of the Interior. The between the, the Colorado River Compact in 1922, the Upper Colorado River Compact, and the treaty with Mexico, um, there was 18 million acre feet allocated in the basin. And the original uh, negotiators of the Colorado River Compact in 1922 thought that was plenty because they thought there was about 22 million acre feet in the river at that point in time. And in fact, there's a provision in the compact that specifies for the later negotiation of the surplus water that they thought was going to be there. And they thought there was plenty of water for an eventual treaty with Mexico. And they thought there was plenty of water to deal with the reserved rights of Native American tribes in the basin that would eventually be settled. Um, as when, when the Upper Colorado River Compact was negotiated, uh, the upper basin states recognized that despite the fact that the lower basin had a firm allocation, that in the upper basin, um, we really didn't know how much water would be available. Because of that requirement to, to provide a firm delivery or, or non-depletion at Lee Ferry, Arizona. So the upper Colorado River Basin Compact allocates whatever water is available on a percentage basis. And you can see what's happened over time. The, the upper line on the, um, the, the red line at the top is um, supply and the blue line at the bottom is demand. And this is overall as an entire basin. Uh, the red line starts in about 1922 when the compact was negotiated. As I mentioned, they thought there was about 22 million acre feet in the river at the time. As we now know, the, the average over the last 20, 30 years or so has been more in the order of um, 13 million acre feet. So we're dealing with increasing demand and um, over, at least over the last 100 years, uh, significantly decreasing supply. I talked about the issue of the upper basin and there, there are two, just, because, just as there are two different allocation systems in the basin between upper basin and lower basin, the upper basin and the lower basin face two very different types of problems. The upper basin faces this problem of hydrologic leftovers. We are obligated to deliver to um, Lee's Ferry, uh, a, 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 it's a non-depletion requirement, so, and, and it's really important for cities like Denver um, because the upper basin is required to not deplete the flow of the river below 75 million acre feet over any 10 year running average. And what the compact provides is if the upper basin fails in that obligation, and it's a collective obligation of all four states, then uses will be curtailed 
until that obligation is met. And that, that curtailment uh, obligation applies to any water user who is junior to the compact, junior to essentially 1922 or 1928, depending on your interpretation. It just so happens that most of the major urban uses in the basin are junior to the compact. So for a city like Denver, where we get half of our water supply from the, co from the upper reaches of the Colorado River Basin, if there were to be a violation of that compact and if the lower basin were to sue the upper basin in the United States Supreme Court, and if they were able to win that litigation, which would probably take about 10 or 20 years and hundreds of millions of dollars in legal fees and engineering fees, but if all that happened and it, there was a curtailment enforced, then Denver could potentially lose half of our water supply. So there is a big stake in the river, and it, and it illustrates the interconnectedness that we have in the basin from Denver all the way down to Mexico. Every city in the basin, every agricultural user in the basin is connected by the problems of overallocation, growth, and climate change that combine to um, impose this degree of uncertainty in the basin. As I mentioned, the lower basin faces um, a very different situation, what's called a structural deficit. And, and these, are, these are round numbers. You can argue about these numbers, but I think they basically illustrate the point of um, the structural deficit problem in the lower basin that's created by the allocation scheme um, in the basin. Total releases from Lake Powell into Lake Mead, um, on average, have been about 8.23 million acre feet a year. And I, I previously talked about 75 million acre feet over 10, 10 years, which equates to an average of 7.5 million acre feet a year. There's also an obligation in the upper basin to meet half of the Mexican treaty do delivery obligation of a million and a half acre feet a year from surplus water in the basin. Now, there's a legal dispute between the upper basin and the lower basin over this obligation that I'm not going to get into. But suffice to say that even at the upper end of deliveries uh, from the upper basin to the lower basin, uses allocated from the main stem are about equal to that inflow. And um, that allocation in the lower basin was, was created by a decree of the United States Supreme Court in Arizona versus California. And unfortunately, the court failed to take into account evaporation losses and system losses in the lower basin, which bring the, the lower basin into this structural deficit of over a million acre feet a year. Within that allocation, and just to illustrate the point of the complex po uh, politics and legal and hydrologic issues, um, California has first priority to that water, and Arizona and um, Nevada are required to uh, share first in any shortages in the basin. So different interests, different systems, different allocation schemes, um, different politics within each state, within the lower basin, within the, lower ba within the upper basin, um, a, a great uncertainty under the treaty with Mexico as to what a shortage might be. Domestic problems, international problems, um, which all um, go to the issue that we could end up in the United States Supreme Court in front of the uh, United States Congress, all kinds of problems that um, would be illustrated by our failure to really proactively deal with changing circumstances, conditions, and a declining water supply and increasing demands in the basin. Fortunately, the basin states and major water users um, in the basin have begun a process of um, not necessarily collaborative all the time, but a process of negotiation whereby we are dealing with those issues proactively. After 10 years of negotiation, Secretary Babbitt in 2001 uh, executed surplus guidelines in, in the basin. At that point in time, we were dealing with a surplus, believe it or not, uh, and how to allocate that surplus. And the law of the river didn't really provide any specificity or criteria uh, for, for how to do that. California was overusing its apportionment by about 800,000 acre feet and had just started in a drought uh, in, the, in the early um, 1990s. California asked the basin states to allow it to continue to use surpluses, and the basin states basically said no, which triggered off this 10-year negotiation process. Um, 
in 2001 and in the quantification settlement agreement um, that apportioned water within California that followed, California entered into pro, uh, programs to essentially eliminate that 800,000 acre feet of water use in the, the largest agricultural to urban transfer that has taken place to date in the United States, uh, a deal between the Imperial Irrigation District and San Diego. No sooner was that um, were those surplus guidelines uh, executed and the QSA was um, negotiated, then we entered into a drought in starting in 2002, which continues on today. And so now we had to, we went, the, the, the light switch literally flipped from, from surplus to shortage. And at the, then you had states sitting around the table uh, talking about how we were going to sue each other. Uh, Colorado um, secured an appropriation of $10 million from the Colorado legislature to the Colorado Attorney General's office to begin a litigation fund. Um, we had meetings in which uh, the lawyers um, had uh, a, a big stake at the table, and it was all over how much water uh, the upper basin was going to release from Lake Powell, what that 8.23 obligation really was. Was it 8.23, or was it more, or was it less? Secretary Norton, uh, who was Secretary of the Interior at the time, uh, wrote a letter to the Basin States and she said, well, I don't really know how much I uh, can release from Lake Powell, but I'm going to tell you it may be less than, than 8.23 million acre feet, and I'm going to give you two years to reach your own agreement on how the operations between Lake Powell and Lake Mead are going to work, and if you don't do it, then I'm going to do something that probably n none of you is going to like. Um, so there was some motivation, there was a deadline. Uh, the, the Department of the Interior provided tremendous support to the Basin States in terms of uh, modeling um, expertise. And in 2007, the Basin States and the Department of the Interior agreed on interim surplus guidelines. So we had learned something in those negotiations, uh, and it's inherent in the word interim. The Colorado River Compact is premised on a perpetual allocation of water. The negotiators of that compact um, thought that they were doing something that would last forever. And of course, now we know that nothing lasts forever, and any projection that we do is going to be wrong. And so the 2007 interim guidelines were interim until the period 2026. They were very significant in that they resolved the issue of the, of the uh, balancing of the operation of Lakes Powell and Mead. They implemented um, interim um, um, uh, a way for the lower basin states to be, be able to, to create credits from imported water, extraordinary conservation, and other means, and put those credits into Lake Mead for later allocation and greater flexibility. And it provided uh, essentially a table of operations that um, describe how and when the lower basin is going to al begin to allocate shortages. Now you can argue about the adequacy of those measures, but they are important first steps going forward and set the table, I think, for hopefully an ongoing relationship of um, negotiation going forward. And then finally, um, through a series of negotiations, Minute 319 to the Mexican Treaty, um, <coughs> Uh, created a framework by which Mexico could uh, share in the creation of ICS, these credits in Lake Mead, benefit from the operation of um, uh, Lake Mead from water conserved in Mexico, so still within the framework of the treaty, um, and during this interim period um, agree on how Mexico was going to uh, or will be able to um, share in shortages. So this is the operational table that was negotiated, um, and, I, and probably the important point for those of you all the way in the back of the room is the, are the red lines that are there. And as, as, um, as Lake Powell and Lake Mead rise and fall, they go through these tiers that were negotiated in the 2007 operational guidelines. And it's amazing that uh, um, we kind of laugh among ourselves, that those of us who negotiated this, because we created these tiers, and immediately the reservoirs began to hover right around those tiers. And they were, you know, six inches above and six inches below. And um, it's kind of, you know, there was uh, right after these, in, in 2008, uh, Lake Powell was 
just above the equalization tier and all the upper basin states were apoplectic because we had to agree that the deal was we were going to release 9 million acre feet and, and of course that wasn't fair. And then a couple years later the, the tier with the Lake Powell was just below that tier and the lower basin became apoplectic and we said well, we, you know, every, a deal's a deal, we stuck by the deal. And, and so year by year it, uh, there, are, there are inequities but overall I think it's worked um, quite well. The drought continues. It's um, now 12, 13 years um, hence since 2002 and as a total system we're sitting at about 45 percent, uh, 51 percent in, in Lake Powell as of November and 38 percent in Lake Mead. So there are going to be releases that are coming down from, from Lake Powell to uh, somewhat equalize those releases. So what happens in the future? Um, I talked about that supply and demand curve from the past and this is from the Colorado River Basin study. The blue fuzziness is uh, a compilation of 112 or so different climate models of what might happen to water supply uh, in the basin going forward and uh, the red fuzziness going up is, are projections of what possibly might happen to demands in the basin going forward. So um, you can see we have a continuing challenge and a great degree of uncertainty uh, facing us moving forward. What are we talking about today? Um, I talked about the, the upper basin problem of hydrologic leftovers and when we look at the condition and water supply in Lake uh, Powell and what is at stake in Lake Powell, we need a contingency plan. We need an emergency response plan in the upper basin. I mentioned that Lake Powell is the bank account which provides for the, the, the equalization of these sporadic flows in the Colorado River and provides the ability for the upper basin to meet this non-depletion uh, averaging uh, obligation to the lower basin. Lake Powell is also extremely important in terms of hydroelectric power that's generated uh, from Lake Powell, uh, which supplies um, rural communities all over the upper basin and funds um, the upper basin endangered species recovery program. Um, Lake Powell is obviously extremely important in terms of regulating flows through the Grand Canyon. Um, both recreational, uh, archaeological preservation, natural environment, we all understand the importance of the Grand Canyon and the importance of management of, of flows to the Grand Canyon. So if Lake Powell is, is allowed to drop below its minimum power pool, it's kind of like a black hole. It creates a compact delivery obligation problem for the upper basin it means we're not generating that hydropower resource and it means we can't regulate flows to the lower basin through the Grand Canyon. Um, and so from an upper basin perspective, we, we really have to figure out a way that as Lake Powell approaches critical elevations, approaching minimum power pool, what's our emergency response plan? And there are really only two ways aside from I guess importing water from the Columbia or the Mississippi or something but um, I'll put that to the side. There are really only two ways to effectively deal with that problem. One is to move water down strategically from upper uh, federal reservoirs such as Flaming Gorge, Navajo, Blue Mesa, Blue Mesa um, in ways that um, can, can keep that power pool um, going and, and keep uh, Lake Powell within those operational tiers harder than one might think because each of those federal reservoirs is operated according to record of decisions for endangered fish flows, for recreational purposes, for project purposes. When they were originally built, they were originally built for as additional storage buckets to allow the upper basin to meet our obligation. But since that time, uh, a lot of dependencies and politics and environmental consequences relate from just simply moving that water down. So the upper basin states are working with Interior and other stakeholders to figure out how, when, and under what conditions that water can be moved down uh, to shore up Lake Powell when necessary. The second way to manage um, Lake Powell um, levels is by managing our demands, essentially reducing demands to create more water and allow wa water to flow into Lake Powell. 
Denver Water, along with the Southern Nevada Water Authority, Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, the Central Arizona Project, and the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, last year entered into a, an agreement called the System Conservation Agreement, by which we collectively put up $11 million. The idea was to uh, experiment, to do pilots, to um, see if there were ways to create uh, temporary, voluntary, and compensated ways to work with water users to essentially pay them to either not use water or to conserve water, put water in the river to create water for the benefit of the system and for the benefit of Lake Powell. It was a very controversial um, proposal in the agricultural community in particular and in rural areas because they said, okay, here they come. We got the, we got the target on our back. This is all about getting water to Las Vegas. Um, this is all about water, getting water to the municipalities. This is all about um, um, destroying the agricultural economy. So in the upper basin, we were very careful um, to do several things. One was to um, establish a partnership with the agricultural community and with, uh, with NGOs that had been working with um, agricultural water users on conservation programs. The second thing we did was we made it clear that was, this is not about agriculture. This is about, first of all, a partnership between cities and agriculture and um, NGOs for the benefit of the system as a whole. And third, we set the program up with the basin states, with the upper, with the upper Colorado River basin states. So it didn't become a municipal initiative. It became a state-led and run and managed initiative so we could deal with the politics and establish credibility in the program. We, to date, uh, we have several pilots that were funded in both the upper basin and the lower basin uh, this year that have um, created some water. What we're doing is we're studying how much water has been created, what the reaction of the farmers is, we're testing the price. We're not worrying about how we shepherd the water from where it's created down to Lake Powell. That's kind of one step beyond where we are right now. So we're basically just creating the water and we're hoping the gravity um, does its job and moves that water eventually uh, down to Lake Powell for the benefit of the system. Again, the idea is to um, begin to have this, this dialogue about if we get into an emergency, how do we stand up a program that will reduce demands in the basin to, to make sure that the, that the system operates in a sustainable way. Um, in the lower basin, as I mentioned, the, the challenge is to um, be able to deal with the structural deficit. How do you deal with the fact that there's one over a million acre feet of essential long-term shortages that uh, exist in the lower basin and among the, the lower basin water users? Um, so again, what are we looking at in the future? Climate change is uh, a, a given. We know that the earth is getting warmer. A lot of you know the details of climate change a lot better than I do, but for, from a water management standpoint, um, it's, it's a situation that looking at different scenarios moving forward on the Colorado River Basin, we have to deal with that reality of, of what it will mean for overall water management in the basin as well as uh, site-specific use. I wonder if growth is really a, a threat in the basin. And from a municipal standpoint, um, we get hit all the time with, well, if you would just stop growing and if you would just stop using water and if you would just rip out all the lawns, then we'd all be okay. Um, if you look at the major water utilities that are pulling water from the river today, um, Metropolitan Water District um, has a pipeline that, that is capable of pulling 1.2 million acre feet of water a year. I think the likelihood of Met putting another straw in the river is probably slim and none. If you look at um, Denver and the Colorado Front Range, we collectively pull about a half a million acre feet uh, a year from the upper Colorado River Basin. For those of you who have been involved in the state water plan, you know that there's a little bit of dialogue about east slope, west slope, and, and what the prospects for a future Trans Mountain diversion in Colorado really is realistically. And from even if there were, even if there is, is development of additional Trans Mountain diversion projects in Colorado, um, it's frankly not going to be that significant. Um, so I think if you look at the major water uses in the basin, and if you um, 
go back to this to this chart of of demands, I would argue that that red line on there is, is if you look at the Colorado River Basin study, is premised on demands that are outside the basin, and and it looks at the potential that those demands could come from the basin. But given that, that blue fuzziness and the climate change, I have to question, you know, realistically, how much of that is really going to occur. Um, and so I'm going to be, I don't know if optimistic is the right word, but I would, um, I'm going to say that, that I, I don't think that growth um, is really the threat that um, it's made out to be. Um, that climate change is really the true challenge that we face in the basin. What we need is um, continued negotiation and innovation and diplomacy in the basin. I mentioned these differences between upper basin and lower basin. We're really challenged by those differences in terms of coming together. But as you look at the modeling and you look at what's possible in the upper basin from a uh, emergency response plan, and you look at what's possible in the lower basin in terms of dealing with the structural deficit. And then if you look at the synergies of putting those two approaches together, literally the, the whole is much more than the sum of those two parts. Uh, and it illustrates the fact that as seven states, we can do a whole lot more than we can do individually either or either as an upper basin or as a lower basin. Um, I frankly, for one, am concerned that those discussions are not occurring, occurring with the urgency that they need to occur. Um, there are some discussions that are, that are ongoing, but again, going back to, to Ken Wright's talk, and if you look at the span of time, you look at what we have created in this basin in the last 100 years in terms of population growth and infrastructure development, you look at what has occurred in the basin over the last 20 years in terms of the wild fluctuations in huge reservoir systems, um, I would argue that we could quickly get caught in a situation where we're behind the curve. And we need to be ahead of the curve and, and moving forward. So I, I, for one, continue to push the basin states and the Department of the Interior to accelerate these discussions and build on these successes that we've had. So with that, I'll end, and then I don't know where we go from there. Thank you, Jim. I'd like to present Jim with his Thank gifts you. for joining us today. We appreciate it. And we're going to open it up now to a few questions, either for Ken Wright or for Jim Lockhead. If anyone has any questions, please feel free. Did you all not have enough coffee yet? <laughs> yep. Yes. I have a question. Just to kind of unite the two talks together, can you perhaps discuss about like, more sensitivity and just that storage of the teaching that you want to see? Like, like, how long term are you scaling it up from two weeks of early to four weeks? Can you repeat the question, please? Pardon me? Can you repeat the question? Okay. So the question relates to reservoir sedimentation, kind of tying the two together. Ken, Ken was talking about these, these periods of sedimentation in these smaller reservoirs. I forget the sedimentation projections for, say, Lake Powell, but um, I'm going to say they're on the order of two to 300 years. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's all going to be OK. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good question. So the question the question relates to you know the fixed allocation of color of, of of water under water rights decrees in the upper basin states versus the percentage allocation and this uncertainty of, of delivery. And if you're a court 
how do you decide what's the tripping point, if you will? What's, at what point do you, do you trip over the, the upper basin's obligation? Um, it, it, it's a, a really significant question. Um, and what we've created, I think, in the upper basin is um, a potential tragedy of the commons where um, water development occurs in each of the states in the upper basin Collectively, you can argue that any individual one doesn't trip the upper basin over this obligation, but collectively, they all do. Um, several years ago, the Colorado Water Conservation Board undertook a study. I think they spent um, $5 million to try and answer the question of how much water does Colorado have left to develop. And I um, joked to the director of the Colorado Water Conservation Board that for a million bucks, I'll give the answer right now. And the conclusion they, come, they came up with was zero to a million. <laughs> um, and so the answer is we don't know. And um, I think that part of the solution in terms of managing demands and, and, and reservoir releases in the, in the upper basin to keep um, uh, Lake Powell whole should be a common administrative scheme in the basin to, um, to manage water between the four states. And it could be done, for example, I think, with a, um, a, a memorandum of understanding between the state engineers of all four states as to how they're going to conjunctively manage water rights in the basin to meet that obligation. Um, significantly, I think, in Colorado, we have begun to recognize this issue um, I mentioned the state water plan and the debate over a Trans Mountain diversion. One of the agreements that was reached through the state water plan was an agreement between East Slope and West Slope on what are called the seven points of light or the seven um, pillars or something that are a conceptual framework under which a new Trans Mountain pro uh, project might be developed. And one of the keys to that is a recognition by the Colorado Front Range that uh, the Colorado Front Range in the development of any such project would bear the hydrologic risk of that project um, and recognizing this, this very problem that, that you raise that, that any new such project can't rely on a secure, firm uh, yield. This is actually a good question. <coughs> good. Uh, thanks for that. Really presentation about those uh, Native Americans and their, their water use. Um, one thing, I, I guess I was trying to tie together in my mind, and maybe it, it's not tied together, you can tell us, was their evacuation of those sites at all related to the silting up of their reservoirs, or are they just separate activities? Were your question was regarding the evacuation of the site based upon the silt siltation in the yeah, reservoirs? Yeah, I mean, did, did the lack of water drive them to leave? Yeah, did, a follow up question to uh, the modern situation is that can happen to us. But anyway, exactly. Why did, they, why did they leave? Why did they leave their food on the table? Yeah. Was it related to the silted reservoirs? Well, it's always been a, a mystery uh, about why did the southwestern Colorado. Uh, let's say southwestern United States, uh, go depopulated totally uh, about 1300 A.D. And everything points to um, the water shortages creating stress uh, between communities and just plain old stress and collapse of organization and uh, raiding parties from one Pueblo to another including uh, massacres and cannibalism. And when I think of drought, I don't worry about or think about how much water we're going to have for our lawns, but how it's going to affect uh, social relationships and uh, wars and migrations. Because you can imagine um, what we see in Eastern Europe at the present time due to war, that could also be due to water shortages in the future. Anyway, from the standpoint of Mesa Verde area, the uh, sediment had no relationship to the water shortages. <clears throat> it's just a result of hundreds of years of inflow. As far as the uh, leaving and depopulating of the Southwest, it was uh, due to um, the results of uh, shortages 
for instance, the 50-year uh, drought I told you about that started in 1135, uh, that caused a total collapse of a wonderful place in northwest New Mexico, um, um, a wonderful community. It's a archaeological site. And it's a uh, National Park Service monument. Um, but the last uh, timber that was dated for this particular place was dated uh, um, 1130, 1142, shortly after the drought started. So you can see the, the relationships. Well, thank you very much. We sure appreciate your attention. And glad that you saw a little bit about ancient America and what Native Americans could do before Columbus sailed for America. Thank you, Ken, and thank you, Jim. Those were very, very interesting talks. I just want to close up with a few items, a few housekeeping items. Um, all of the concurrent sessions for the rest of the conference will be located in, a, in the other tower, which is across the Port Cocher. Um, so they're on the second floor and the 38th floor, so pay attention to where the rooms are listed in your program. There's a little bit of jumbling around. Um, we'll only be back over here in this room for Wednesday's lunch, um, and tomorrow night's event is downstairs in this building. Otherwise, everything else will be over in the other building across the, the driveway. Easier way to say that. <laughs> um, if you haven't already picked up your registration materials, if you haven't checked in, that registration is also located up on the 38th floor across the way. The speaker's presentation room is the Tories Peak Room, and it's on the second floor across the way. Um, restrooms are located on both levels. Today and Tuesday, the Capitol Peak A Ballroom is the location of the poster session and the networking breaks the commercial and educational exhibits, and it's also the location of tonight's networking event. It's over on the 38th floor. Near the registration desk on the 38th floor is also the AWA Conservation Corner, a place for meeting with colleagues, networking, and checking emails. You will also find the Career Opportunities Board over there with job postings and any jobs you might like to post. There is also a board available for you, your use to post resumes on. During Tuesday's lunch break, there will be a 5K fun run and walk led by our illustrious past president, Bill Pataglin. So meet him in the lobby of the hotel. Um, we'd like for you to register for that walk if you'd like, or run and walk if you'd like to do that by 8.30 tomorrow morning, just so that we know who's going to show up so he doesn't leave anyone behind. Um, most days, lunch is on your own, except for Wednesday. Um, in order to help you out with your lunch search, the committee has put together a list of nearby restaurants. Um, feel free to grab a copy upstairs or take a picture with your phone to save paper. Of the, they're upstairs by the registration desk as well. Um, there's also a 16th Street Mall free shuttle, which will take you to a bunch of different restaurants along the 16th Street Mall. It takes you all the way down to Union Station as well in Larimer Square. Um, as I mentioned earlier, on Tuesday evening is the, network, the interactive networking event, Water in the West, that is co-sponsored by AWA Colorado Section, the Pond Committee of the Colorado Water Congress, and the Colorado Foundation for Water Education. The cost for that is $25. If you haven't already registered, please register by noon tomorrow. It really will be a fun and interactive evening. I hope to see you all there. Uh, throughout the week, we will have our technical committee meetings. Those are listed in the program. And any of those technical committees you might be interested in getting involved in, please attend those meetings. They're open to anyone at the conference. The conference luncheon and awards will be on Wednesday. They'll be in the, back in this room. If you plan to attend, we ask that you please exchange your luncheon voucher for a ticket by noon today so that we can get a head count. Um, if, and don't forget to bring that ticket that you exchange it for to the luncheon on Wednesday. If you need a vegetarian lunch, please let us know at the registration desk by 5 o'clock today. And at the luncheon, just ask your server for that option. This year, we've added a new feature. It is a workshop focused on young professionals. It's chaired by AWA board member Wayne Wright from GeoEngineers and will feature presentations from representatives of geoengineers, MWH Global, and McCormick Consulting. 
The workshop is on Wednesday the 18th in the Capitol Peak A room on the 38th floor. All young professionals are welcome to attend. And on Wednesday evening, we'll have our annual student career night, which is a speed networking followed by question and answer session with various professionals. It will be on the 38th floor. The purpose of this event is to match students with professionals in different disciplines for a short conversation of their chosen career path. Another feature of our conference is the Ask Me About program. We have little white tags you can add to your name tag and ask, add, ask people to ask you about something. It's just a great way to get conversation started, so please pick up one of the ribbons upstairs and write down something that you'd like to talk about with some of your fellow conference attendees. We would like to acknowledge, oh, I, one second. Should have had this up while I was talking. I apologize to our conference sponsors. We'd really like to thank all of our conference sponsors for sponsoring and helping out with this event. Um, without you, it's not possible, so thank you again. Our networking break will begin shortly. It's in the Capitol Peak A Ballroom. It's on the 38th floor across the way, and the technical sessions will begin at 10.30 after that. One other quick housekeeping note, if, in case of emergency, you can pick up any of the house, form, house phones and dial 55 on them. Um, the elevators will be locked down in case of emergency, so take the stairs. Hopefully that does not happen. Um, just want to thank you all again for coming today. I'm looking forward to seeing you all throughout the week, and sorry for that long laundry list of kind of boring items. So <laughs> thanks again to our plenary speakers and to my committee and AWRA staff and board. Thank you all.